Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Deirdre Cross, and I work in public programs here at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And it's my pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon for our author discussion um, featuring Stephen Shames, Bobby Seal, and Dr. Hassan Jeffries to discuss the book Power to the People, The World of the Black Panthers. We are really thrilled to have you here this afternoon, and this actually inaugurates our series of programs that looks at power and agency uh, in the years following um, segregation and, is, and actually highlights the exhibition A Changing America that is at the upper level of the History Gallery here in this building. If you have not seen the exhibition, I hope that well, I don't know if there's a lot of time today, but you could just hop right over across the hall and take in a few minutes and certainly uh, come back because we are pleased to be here for a very long time. Um, and in addition, we have other programs coming up in November, and it would be great if you could check those out on our website, nmaahc.si.edu. Um, we're going to start the afternoon with a short visual presentation presented by um, Mr. Stephen Shames. Um, and then we will um, go on with the rest of the program. Dr. Hassan Jeffries will inter interview both Mr. Bobby Seal and Mr. Shames. So without further, oh, and the evening ends, the afternoon ends with a book signing. Um, from all three authors, so we hope you'll be able to join us for that and a really wonderful discussion this afternoon. So without further delay, I'd like to welcome Mr. Stephen Shane to the podium and begin our program. Yeah, thank you for, for attending. Um, Bobby Seale and I did this book, Power to the People, the World of the Black Panthers, uh, to honor the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Black Panthers, the Black Panther Party. Um, and what I'm going to do is just show you a number of, of pictures that, that are in the book, but the book also contains an oral history um, with uh, about uh, a dozen or, or, or 20 of, of the Panthers who, who are still living um, talking about what, what was going on. The Black Panther Party was a political party. It was not just a protest group. They actually, even as early as 1968, they ran people for office. Um, uh, Bobby's idea um, that if you're going to have a power that you need to have people in the legislature and in mayor office and in the other seats so they can actually uh, pass laws. Obviously, the segregation laws were passed by people. So Bobby uh, formed the Black Panther Party uh, to do that. And then he also... Uh, did a, a, they also had a, a about 50 or 60 community programs. I, I start off with this picture to just give people an idea of why was the Black Panther Party needed. In the richest nation of the earth, um, in the history of the earth, there were children going to school uh, hungry. There were children sleeping in rat-infested um, buildings. This is Bedford-Stuyvesant in, in Brooklyn. Early on, the first thing that the Panthers dealt with was uh, uh, police brutality and police uh, um, murdering um, young black men. And aren't we glad that that isn't happening anymore? Exactly. Um, but Denzel Dow was, was killed in Richmond, and this is, that's a picture, that isn't my photo, but that's, I wanted to put in the presentation to just show you the first issue of the Black Panther paper and the first thing that the Panthers organized and Bobby and Huey organized patrols of the police. That's Bobby Seale. That's the first picture I took of Bobby. That was on an, an anti-Vietnam peace march. The Vietnam War was, was going on then in 1967. And Bobby and Huey um, sold red books, and that's one of the ways that they, uh, that they, uh, they raised money. Um, early on, Huey Newton, um, was arrested, there was a shootout with a police officer, and Huey got wounded, and the police officer got killed, and they charged him with murder and put him on trial. And so the Free Huey was uh, the big campaign that the, the Panthers, um, you know, that the Panthers did in Oakland and, and all across the country. 
Um, the picture on the left is actually in Washington when Bobby Seale was speaking during the Democratic Convention. And as some of you may know, he was later arrested and charged with or organizing the, what was uh, later termed by the commission that studied it a police riot. Uh, you didn't know that Bobby controlled the Chicago police and caused them to riot, but that's, that's kind of what happened, uh, or that's what they said happened. Uh, that's the Alameda County Courthouse. This is kind of, uh, uh, you know, the media image of, of the Panthers. One of the things that you'll see is you see the pictures in the book, and that's Bobby speaking. Um, that's Kathleen Cleaver, who was a Panther leader. Um, the, the, although women were, I won't say that women were equal in the Black Panther Party, two-thirds of the Panthers were women, and there was no organization back then that actually, you know, liberal or conservative, where women were equal. There were very few women in public office, but the Panthers were more progressive than most of the other organizations. There were uh, many women in the leadership, and Kathleen Cleaver w was, was one of them. Um, what I was saying, and of course, uh, who knows who that is? Exactly. And I love that picture on, on the right, it, really the, how the Panthers and Angela um, just, you know, what the youth thought about it, and how, how, how inspiring the, the, the movement was. We don't want to forget that. Um, that's the cover of the book, but that's, a, again, this is the most famous uh, picture that I've, I've taken of the Panthers. This is kind of the public image. As you'll see, as we go on, maybe when we get to the programs and the other things, you'll see that there's another side of the Panthers besides the militant image. This is Eldridge Cleaver. Um, when he was speaking at Berkeley, he was running for president in the Peace and Freedom Party. And that's the crowd. Um, anyone who wants to tell you that the Panthers didn't have a wide way, uh, base of support, not only in the black community, but also among students and, and other people, where you can just look at this picture and judge for yourself, um, that's a campaign poster. Uh, Kathleen Cleaver ran for office. Bobby and, and Huey ran for office. So as early as 1968, the Panthers were running candidates. The Panthers were very involved in the campaign of Ron Dellums for Congress. And he became a congressman. And under President Clinton, the first President Clinton, not the second President Clinton to be, um, <laughs> hopefully, um, under the first President Clinton, he was uh, chairman of the Armed Services Committee. It was a very uh, uh, powerful position. Um, after Huey Newton was not convicted of first-degree murder, he was convicted of manslaughter. Uh, that was later overturned. But uh, two policemen shot up, two Oakland police officers shot up the office. And you can see um, they kind of were shooting at Huey. Bobby Hutton on the left was the first Panther, 17-year-old. A uh, teenager was the first Panther um, uh, murdered by the police. On the right, you see San Francisco State at the top and Ber University of California at Berkeley at the bottom is George Murray speaking at the top. I was a student at the University of California. Both those universities had year-long strikes to create black uh, studies departments and black studies courses. In 1968, those did not exist. There was no women's studies, no Asian studies, no Latino studies, no black studies. There was white studies. And, you know, that was pretty much what it was. And the students felt that, that the contributions, obviously, of the other people who um, were also American should be honored. And so um, the students at, at San Francisco State and Berkeley uh, uh, struck, and eventually the, the departments were created after a, a bunch of bloodshed. The survival programs, most famous of which is the breakfast program. And I want you to think about this picture. How often in the media do you see a positive image of, of a black man? You know, a black man feeling positive. Look at that child. Look at those children. Look, look what's going on there. This is a side of the Panthers that's often been ignored in the media. And one of the reasons we did the book is we want people to understand that demonstrating is often necessary. I mean, Black Lives Matter is a very necessary organization, but there's also another side. It isn't all about militancy and demonstration. It's about engaging in the community. It's about programs. It's about people understanding that, that you've got to look at all people in America in a, in a multi-dimensional uh, way, not in a stereotypical way. 
And I think you all, all know what I'm, what I'm talking about, and we hope that this book will, you know, will, will, will do that. Um, I love that picture of those two women. Uh, nobody's going to take their food bags away from them. <laughs> they're, they're, they're there. Um, if, if you, it's hard to read, but you can see it in the book. That's a listing in the bottom right of all the Panther programs. And what you're seeing is this free shoe program, free clothing program. And at the top right, the Panthers would escort senior citizens when they went shopping in crime-ridden neighborhoods so they, they didn't get robbed. Again, you know, is that something a bunch of thugs do? You know, the, as J. Edgar Hoover uh, portrayed them, call, called them, and Richard Nixon called them a bunch of thugs. But here they're escorting senior citizens um, so that they don't get robbed. Um, sickle cell anemia testing. The sickle cell was kind of on the back burner until the Panthers really popularized the fact that, that, uh, that people needed to be tested. And they would, and what's also interesting about the Panthers, they didn't make people come to them. They would go out into the community. They'd go door to door. They'd be out in street corners. They'd, they'd do the testing right out in the street. Again, serving the people. Panthers started a school, initially for their children, so that the children wouldn't get killed when the police, you know, raided the office. But then eventually they uh, started what, what, you know, they didn't call it a charter school, but it, it was like a charter school. And it got an award. Um, people came and studied it. And people from the community came in. It was a wonderful school for some of the Panther kids. Selling the newspaper. Um, that's Emery Douglas on the left, who drew most of these drawings, including the cover you see on the paper. Um, women, again, were very, very active in, in, in the party. I'm going to have to go faster. These are three members of the Lumpen. There's a, a, a picketing of business. Um, on the right is Jamal Joseph, who's a professor. He was nominated for an Academy Award. He's a documentary filmmaker now, and he's a full professor at Columbia University. I mean, people don't understand the depth of the leadership of the rank and file and even the second level of leadership in the Panthers. These, these, these men and women are doing incredible things, even, even today. Um, community Survival Conference, um, Panthers marching in, uh, in, in um, West, uh, West Philadelphia. There's a Panther just, you know, they, again, they're out in the street talking to people, asking people, you know, what's going on. That's the Toledo office, Mike Cross, the leader of that office. Um, fortified office in New Haven. As you all know, the FBI, there was a series. I mean, Bobby will talk about it when we, when we do the q and I'm sure. Um, there was a series of raids by the FBI orchestrated by uh, President Nixon of the Panther offices, so they, they fortified the office. The Panthers didn't attack, but they did believe in self-defense, which is an honored American value. As we know, um, the, the right-wing Republicans um, are making a big deal about the Second Amendment and self-defense, but somehow that didn't, at, back in that time, it didn't necessarily in include uh, African Americans. Um, they should have read the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment doesn't have a little clause in there that says, except African Americans. Everyone else can have guns. Um, that's Fred Hampton on the left, who was assassinated by the police while he was sleeping. New York 21 um, were put on trial, allegedly, for trying to blow up the, uh, the Bronx Botanical Garden. And to me, that's kind of funny. At a time when the United States was defoliating um, Vietnam with, for Agent, Origin, Agent Orange, they accused the Panthers of trying to blow up some trees. These are some of the New York 21. Um, that's David Hilliard on the left, was chief of staff. And that's Huey P. Newton on the right with Elaine Brown, who were Panther leaders. Um, George Jackson on the left who was a Panther in San Quentin, and that's at his funeral. And again, that, you know, what's interesting about this book is I had unlimited access. Um, I was the only one in, in, in the church. The Panthers trusted me. I had a relationship with Bobby initially. He was a mentor to me and taught me a lot. And um, I got to know all the Panthers, and they let me in, and a lot of my pictures were in the Panther paper. Um, this is uh, taking the, the casket out of, you know, after the, the, the service. And, and that's a Safeway supermarket in the back. And 
Um, there's a kind of funny story here that the, the uh, manager of the supermarket called the Oakland police and said, you know, there, there's all this big crowd in the parking lot. No one can come and shop, shop here. I, I want you to clear the parking, parking lot. And the police said, you're closed down today. <laughs> Panther office in, the, in, in West Oakland. Again, you know, it looks like a kind of a, I love this picture. Someone's mowing the lawn. A kid's coming by talking to them. Um, again, that's a different view of the Panthers, isn't it, than what you might think from reading the, uh, the papers. It's Huey Newton, the co-founder with Bobby Seale of the party. Um, Huey and Bobby, again, you know, I love this. People have this image that these guys, you know, they were funny. They joked around. They, they you know, there, there, there was... Uh, was Bobby Seale when he was in jail before, you know, uh, he, he was, uh, you know, he was in jail um, for Chicago and also for a, a trial in New Haven. That's Erica Huggins, who was a Panther leader and who was a, uh, uh, on trial with Bobby in New Haven. That's Big Man, one of the six original Panthers. And I love that picture on the left. That kind of sums up the 60s to me. Bobby ran for mayor in 1972, 73, ran for mayor of Oakland, got 40% of the vote, paved the way in the next election, Lionel Wilson became the first African-American uh, mayor of Oakland. And as I, as I said before, um, the, the Panthers were very instrumental in, the, in electing Ron Dellums to Congress and, and uh, um, Barbara Lee, who's in Congress right now, a very progressive congresswoman. There's Bobby campaigning. And I end, we end the book with a, a little essay of bringing it up today. And this is uh, 2014 in Washington at, at a rally, uh, just to remind us that most of the issues that the Black Panthers organized around have still not been resolved. I, I don't need to tell anyone here how disgusting this presidential campaign has been and how just with the racist and misogynistic statements of this guy whose name I can't remember and don't want to say, but, um, you know, it's, it's really amazing. 50 years later, we're kind of facing, you know, the, you know, we thought it had gone away when we got rid of the segregationists in the South and the Civil Rights Bill passed, but we haven't gotten rid of it. And for those of you who are young here, there's a, a struggle continues, and I hope that some of you will, will pick up where the Panthers um, where the Panthers uh, left off. And with that, I'd like to bring uh, Bobby and... Uh, Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is, a, it is an absolute pleasure and honor to be with you uh, here in this magnificent facility, uh, museum, uh, but especially uh, with Brother Kane and with Brother Bobby Seal. It is an absolute honor, absolute honor and pleasure. This afternoon, we have, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, sort of the history of the Black Panther Party, um, and you know, sort of these, these, these personal experiences, reflections, but then also draw a little bit on some of the photographs that we already showed, the, the magnificent, uh, these wonderful uh, photographs. You know, this is the 50th anniversary. Uh, October marks the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Black Panther Party for self-defense. And to a certain extent, uh, it's obvious why you would publish uh, this sort of history um, this photographic history of, of the Black Panther Party. Uh, but it seems to me, uh, Brother Seal, it seems to me that the reason for this collaboration and publishing this book isn't simply uh, to put uh, some pretty pictures of the Panthers uh, on a coffee table, uh, that getting this history correct 
um, is really sort of a driving motivation uh, for publishing this work. Could you say a few words on why, why now and why in this particular form did you want to get this history of the Panthers uh, out to the people? Well, actually, why now, yes, it's just this anniversary founding period. Um, a lot of organizations and others have this founding period in mind. They have small operations that are closing. But um, my attitude here is that it's for the youth to, to open up and understand uh, the interconnected relationship of my, the organization that, 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 that I caused to exist primarily and uh, why I did it. You know, um, uh, the 50th anniversary of the Black Panther Party was October 22nd, 1966. Uh, we started writing that 10 point program really uh, October the 10th. And my book sees the time, it says the 15th. But the book sees the time was written in jail under extreme harsh conditions. I mean, I had just been beat up in 1969 by six guards in the San Francisco County Jail and thrown in the hole for several days and things like this here. Uh, the beginning of that year of 1969 Richard M. Nixon was sworn in as president of the United States of America. Uh, John Mitchell, who was the United States Attorney General at that time under Nixon, uh, had pronounced on national television, by the end of this year, we'll be rid of the Black Panthers. This was 1969, three years after I created this organization, the Black Panther Party. Now, the beginning of this party had to do with uh, that book that Kwame Ture uh, and others, Stokely Carmichael, had printed called Black Power. And me, I worked for the city government of Oakland at the time. North, I, I, I was community liaison for the Northwestern Neighborhood Service Center. I long quit my engineering job. You know, I was the guy, I created youth jobs programs and things, but myself at the time, I had been raised in such a way that I mastered professions, skills, and trades where I never worried about a job. In fact, I was working on the Gemini missile program, engineering department, Kaiser Aerospace and Electronics, electromagnetic field, black light, non-disrupt testing for all engine trains was the Gemini missile program when they were putting the missiles out then. <laughs> now, my point is, that's where I was. I knew no politics, what have you, et cetera. But I became very, very interested in the civil rights. I went to hear Dr. Martin Luther King speak. I said, wow, this brother here is speaking. You know, I stopped going to the church because they preached too much hell and damnation, you know, when they had it done. And got tired of just the old, over and over and over thing. But I like this guy. I heard about him. You know, he's trying to stop racism. I got to go hear this brother speak. Oakland Auditorium, Oakland, California. 7,000 seats, every seat was full. I was just one individual. I had a nice job, et cetera, what have you. I was doing nine credit hours on the side at, at Merritt College as an engineering design major. Dr. King was up there blowing and talking about all these companies that refused to hire people of color. And Dr. King got on one point, he says, and right here in the San Francisco, Oakland Bay Area, is this Langendorf Bread Company and Kilpatrick Bread Company will not hire any people of color. He says, and all across America, I say Wonder Bread Company will not hire any people of color. I say we're going to have to boycott them, and we want to boycott them so consistently and so profoundly. I want to hear Mark, uh, we want to make Wonder Bread wonder where the money went. <laughs> Dr. King truly inspired me that context, I'm telling you. Now, this is way before the party started, you know what I mean? And next thing I know, they, they, the Civil Rights Bill was passed, 1964, and from there, you know, I, I created it. I quit my job after three and a half years. I quit my, I had a great job, you know? And I went to work in the, in the grassroots community, and me and other students put together a, a grassroots program in Northwestern California 
out there in that little community of 30, 40,000 people. Well, my wife, she even worked out there after I was in jail. But my point is, I created a youth jobs program with other people. And, you know, where youth was tutoring. I had the 10th graders tutoring the 1st graders and 11th and 2nd grader and so on. And we worked in uh, 36 hours a week, you know, in the summer and 16 hours a week in the winter. And we hired in other personnel and people from the community who was indigenous to the community to continue that program because it was part of my, our, our job description, you know, over a year and a half period. And then I went to work for the city government of Oakland, California. And simultaneously, I, took, I, I worked in organizing a, a, a black history faculty because I lived across the street from Merritt College. And we, as stu young students, wrote the syllabus, did the research, et cetera. And we, we, we put uh, black American history into the curriculum for the first time right there in Merritt College in, in Oakland, California. And so I'm saying, this is where I was at. I had, when I read that history, when I digested our African and African American people's history in, in, in those years, 62, 63, 64, it, it, it was just to read and find out and W.B. Du Bois's that dissertate, dissertative work of black reconstruction, 168,000 black men was enlisted into the Northern Union Army. This blew my mind. 38,000 died. It was these black soldiers who beat the Confederates, and they ain't got over it yet, you know what I mean? But my point is that's what happened in human history, when in the course of human events, in human history, you know? and the 13th Amendment, et cetera. And then I'm looking at the, that gallant framework of fighting and struggling and battling and people dying, et cetera. The, and then they emerged the 13th Amendment, 14th and 15th Amendments, et cetera. And then there were first black congressmen being elected in this re Reconstruction period. You know what I mean? And this is in the 1800s. And I'm reading this in the 1960s and it's blowing my mind. That is what blew my mind. To digest Dr. Herbert Abzacker's work, his work documented 250 slave revolts from the year 1800 to 1857. And what he can constitute as a slave revolt involved 10 or more slaves. He says there were other kinds of resistance going on involving a lesser number of 10 slaves. He says, but this was going on. Black folks weren't just sitting on their butts, they were trying to resist everything they could. In other words, they propagated through history, et cetera, hid the history, said we were docile, said we were backward, said, said all these derogatory misdemeanors about what we were. But we fought, we struggled. Frederick Douglass and others led, with the, did, dealt in the political frameworks in those years. That, read that history, and for me, back in 1966, it blew my mind, you know, and just so much. Of it. So this is the thing that got me going. And so when that book came out, Black Power, some young brothers were talking about, we want black power, we want black power. I said, son, you tell me you ain't gonna get no black power until you take over some of these political seats. What? What do you mean political seats? I said, city council, county supervisors, sheriffs, and all this kind of stuff, you gotta get some of these political seats. These are the people that make the laws and make the rules. Well, them the white man's seats. I say, you better try to make them some black folk seats. <laughs> Brother Seal, let me. <laughs> I say, yeah. so I'm just saying, this, th this is yeah. the real reason, the real motive behind me creating an organization called the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. And I'm talking about a political party. There was, there's certainly in that 1964-1965 period, uh, there's so much emphasis now on the South on what was happening in Selma, Alabama, on what was happening in Lowndes County, Alabama, passage of the Civil Rights Act, passage of the Voting Rights Act, and this sense that things were looking better, things were on the up and up, uh, but that outside of the South, in the North, in the West, things were never that bad. Could you say a little bit about that period in 1966 they were bad. in Oakland? <laughs> you no, know, exactly. Uh, I, I, and what I, the in conditions were. In another way, they weren't as extreme in terms of the vicious, racist, repression, lynchings, murders, and stuff like that going on in the South, no. But we were miserably unregistered to vote. 
So Huey and I, in effect, after we had a big fight with the Berkeley police over me reciting a poem about not fighting in the war in Vietnam and all this kind of stuff, we went to the judge and I told the judge that I worked for the city government of Oakland, nobody shouldn't be putting us in jail, et cetera, and the judge gave us probation. I said, Huey, meet me tonight at the office. You know, I work for the city. I said, tonight, everybody be off work, and we're going to finish writing this 10-point platforming program. So, yeah, we wrote a program, you know, one point about full employment, another point about decent housing, another point about decent education that covers our school history, another point about not being exploited in our African-American community, another point in the first days, number six was we want all black men and black women to be exempted from any military service fighting in the war in Vietnam because this country is not recognizing our constitutional democratic civil human rights. Number seven, <laughs> number seven, we are not going to, we want an immediate end to police brutality and murder of black people. Number eight, we want all black men and women who've been tried by all white juries to have a right to another trial so they can have some black folks who represent the average reasoning person in the black community on some of these juries so we can get a real true fair trial and so on. We summed it up with land, bread, housing, education, clothing, and justice and peace. On another day, we came back and I said, Hewitt, we got to put this two paragraphs. What are these two paragraphs? I said, Declaration of Independence, United States of America. Why do you want to put that? I said, read it. Read what it says, brother. It says, when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for any one people to dissolve the political bondage which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of humankind dictate that they should declare the cause which has compelled them to that separation. Now, what I'm saying here is I'm looking at that, and then by the last part paragraph, says, when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursues and invariably evinces a design to reduce a people under absolute despotism, then it is the right of the people to alter or change that government and provide new guards for their future security and happiness. So we created a 10-point platform and program, decided on point number seven that we're going to go out here and patrol the police. Hewitt was two years in law school, and but prior to that, I had him research every law on guns because we have a right to bear arms just like the white boys have a right to bear arms, right, I mean? And we're not going to let them kill us. They beat up civil rights workers right there and in, 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 in across America and right there in Berkeley and Oakland, California, and, and brutalized people, et cetera, et cetera. So we're going to take the law, and we're going to legally go out here and observe the police. And when we did that with our little 14 people, because we were a ragtag organization that first year, we never had no more than 50 people in the Black Panther Party for a whole year, from October 1966 to October 1967. And when that cop says, you have no right to observe us, we says, no, California State Supreme Court ruling states that every citizen has the right to stand and observe a police officer carrying out their duty, and as long as, long as they stand a reasonable distance away, a reasonable distance from that particular ruling is constituted as 8 to 10 feet. I'm standing approximately 20 feet from you, and we'll observe you whether you like it or not. <laughs> Some system... 25, 30 people on the sidewalk and some sister amongst the crowd, she said, well, go ahead on and tell it, brother. <laughs> the cop says, is that gun loaded? He would say, if I know it's loaded, it's good enough. Well, I have a right. He would say, there's no use. He would say, cite it, something, United States Supreme Court versus so and so and so and so. Therefore, you cannot remove my property from it without due process of law. Step back. You cannot touch my weapon. And this tall brother standing over there, he said, man, what kind of Negroes is these? <laughs> it was a most disciplined method. Now, that little dumb movie that they made called Panther, you know, it got our wheels all up on the curve and all that, and I got my gun and you got your That's some crap. That is not what happened. You see what I'm getting at? We were very disciplined. We knew what we was doing. We had researched every law. We knew our history back before it was sideways and catacornic. And when you come to, when you start t talking to us, boom, and we recited the law to the cop. The cop went on and left. He just got out of there. He, he, he saw, because he looked around, because he didn't even notice it was 14 of us, all with guns. And so those who had long guns, handguns, carried 10-point platform programs. Little Bobby Hutton and I hung the uh, 
tape recorder around here playing and, and punch the record, and you can record, you can record yourself. In other words, if they said we were under arrest, we would take the arrest. Understand where we come from. A formal arrest, we take the arrest because we're not scared of the courtroom. Because when we get to the courtroom, we're going to make a form out of it about you racist, police, brutalizing people. <laughs> in the way. So that's, that was our attitude and that was our practice. That was our basic policy. That's how we started it. Now, we couldn't do this every day. We didn't have that. I had a whole full-time job. Few of us going to night law school, you know what I mean, et cetera. But those little acts of situations where we confronted the police, we read the law to them, et cetera, boom, 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 back them up. We were not arrested. We were not arrested. Then six months later, I led an armed delegation to the California State Legislature. Why? Because the police was there legal. Yeah, boom, boom, boom. So they must assemble the Moffitt. Moffitt put a bill in to try to stop us from carrying loaded weapons. Not carrying the weapons, loaded weapons. They were slick. You can't say a person couldn't carry a, lo a, a weapon. Why? Second Amendment. Ah, you know, and you better not say you're going to take away the Second Amendment. Not only because black folks are there, but because the white boys over there, the racists who got their guns, you ain't going to take my gun. And so, well, they said no one could carry a loaded weapon inside city limits within 150 feet of public property. Public property included all roadways and byways, which meant you had to be 150 feet from the public sidewalk before you could load your gun. So we stopped patrolling the police because we were not going to go out there with unloaded guns. Our guns were loaded. Understand that. And so I'm just saying it was, it was things happened with, with that an armed delegation to the California State Legislature. Our organization, and I swear, I couldn't have had no more than 26, 27 people who were members at the time of that. We had international notoriety. So it's like we popped up right in the middle of an already ongoing nationwide civil human rights protest movement, already ongoing nationwide anti-war protest movement. We popped up in the middle of all of this. This is what happened. There was no shootouts in the first year of the Black Panther Party. The first shootout happened was when Officer Fry shot Huey that night, October 1967. And from there, we evolved. But they put me in jail for leading the delegation to the California State Legislature for six months, misdemeanor, for serving the peace. It wasn't even a guns violation. You know, even when they, even when they charged us, they only charged six people and disturbing the peace of the California State Legislature, the press led us into the, I wanted to spectate a section and the press led us into the re rescinded floor and that caused five of my people and I went in there to get them out, et cetera, because we were in the wrong place. We were not in the spectator section. That's where they put me in jail for six months for. Hugh and them lost the office, et cetera, because I was the one who had all the resources to put stuff together, et cetera, and so on. And then Huey was shot by Officer Fry late October 1967. And then Huey was in jail and prison, prison. Then I come out of jail. And then me and Elder Struve reorganized and we stuck with the Black Panther Party. And we had a free Huey birthday rally. And, then they, and after the free Huey birthday rally where we were merged with, SNCC merged with us and what have you, et cetera. And then uh, Dr. Reverend Ralph Abernathy called me after that. And he says, Mr. Seal, Dr. King is organizing a poor people's march for the in the future here. We want to know, would you, your organization be willing to participate along with a hundred or more organizations from different cities all across the country that Dr. King is organizing? I said, yes, 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 definitely. I, whatever Dr. King wants, you know, we'll do that, et cetera, boom, boom, boom. And that's the first the other coalition we had with SCLC Southern Christian Leadership Conference. After that, my organization, they killed Dr. King. Prior to that, I only had 400 members of the Black Panther Party up and down the West Coast, prior to Dr. King being assassinated. And when they did that, my organization, in seven months, swelled from 400 members up and down the West Coast to 5,000 members in 49 chapters and branches throughout the country. 
they talk about 20 chapters, but in those chapters were branches in other cities inside of a state. So you have to understand the range of what we were talking about here. And that's what happened. Complete with free breakfast programs, free sickle cell and immune testing programs, free preventative medical health care clinics. And those were the first programs I started teaching all the chapters and all the branches. I went to practically every chapter and every branch to teach them the fine specifics and the methodology of grassroots community organizing, programmatic community organizing. Every one of our programs was also connected with voter registration. Because the objective here that I had was that we're going to organize and we can get more and more black politicians and progressive politicians elected in the, in, in, you know, in the, in the legislative bodies all across the country, starting with our local city council legislative bodies and stuff like this. This is the idea. There were 500,000 political seats throughout the whole of the United States of America that one can be elected to. 1965, and you only had 60 black folks to be elected to political office. Take into account for all the local mayor seats, city council seats, county supervisorial seats, sheriff seats, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all across the country. All sheriffs were duly elected, you know, and you only had 50. And that's the reason we put the Black Panther Party together. And it was not just us. That movement itself took on its own as it moved. We ran for political office and put our names on the ballot in the 1968 election. I ran for state assembly in California. Kathleen Cleaver ran for state assembly in, 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 in San Francisco. And we put Elder Cleaver on the ballot with the Peace and Freedom Party in 28 states. Yeah, we garnered two and a half million votes, but we got our feet wet in the political sphere. You see what I'm getting at? Growing and living. That's what was going on. Our coalition politics was key. It was key, and this is what the power structure created, because we crossed all racial lines, ethnic lines, et cetera. We made a distinction between the young white left radical who will protest for my right and my civil rights and the Ku Klux Klan. <laughs> the Ku Klux Klan wanted to kill me, murder me, brutalize me, et cetera, and, 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 and never have allow any rights. I'm saying, so the young white the radicals who was least progressive we had coalition work with them, along with coalition work with the, all the Hispanic organizations, Native American, AIM, et cetera, uh, 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 Brown Berets, Young Chicano, Latino, et cetera. Th th this is where we're coming from. So we pushed black power into the concept of power to the people, power to the people. And party members, wow, when I told them about programs, I got to put them up and talk to them that, et cetera. Winston-Salem, North Carolina, wow, they jumped up. And them brothers had all them other programs, and they created a free ambulance program. Another brother created, a, in another city, created a free pest control program. Sister Audrey Jones, Audrey Dunham, brother, she ran the Boston, Massachusetts State Chapter of the Black Panther Party. She created the free pharmacy program. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters that got creative with this stuff and understood what we were talking about in terms of unifying the people, registering the people to vote, identifying your councilmatic districts, identifying your state assembly and other, knowing in who the politicians was and if they was no good, try to get people to run against them who were progressive, et cetera, and so on. That is what the Black Panther Party was about because they attacked us in the year of 1969. They attacked us. It started when Nixon was elected in November 1968. Nixon was elected. A week after that, in research of my film, he had a meeting with J. Edgar Hoover. The first week of December is the first time that J. Edgar Hoover announced on national television the Black Panther are a threat to the internal security of America. It was not until March that he repeated that, but he said the Black Panther Party's free breakfast for children program was a threat to the internal security of America. Now, you matter. I started a breakfast for children program in September 68, spread like wildfire all across the country. In fact, the breakfast for children program spread beyond people in the Black Panther Party. And the fact of the matter is, Willie Brown, those guys who had got elected in 66 and Miller in California, et cetera, boom, 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 and when J. Edgar Hoover said that stuff, 
these guys went and put a bill in, and I like this, you know, because now we got black politicians doing something positive. They, in effect, put a bill in in the state of California, $5 million for all schools, free breakfast and free lunch programs for students, all schools in the state of California. Sent it to Ronald Reagan, the Republican governor. He vetoes $4 million. They take the bill back, run it back to the state Senate, and bring it back to the state assembly and overrode the, the veto and put the whole damn five million in. Brother Seth, Brother Seth. 28 states across America in the next year's time pass something, state legislatures pass something similar. <laughs> Telling you, this is I, 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 I don't need these questions. No, seriously, Brother, Brother Steele and Brother James, they have a, they, they have to get on the road. So we do have to, we do have to move forward. Yeah. The, we, we, we set aside. Hey, we, Bobby can talk, right? Amen. <laughs> and he deserves the time to talk. But we did set aside a few minutes for uh, a question or two from the audience. So I hope y'all have better luck than me. Um, <laughs> There are some microphones in the back, and not a comment, but, but really just one quick question. If, if, every, if, if anyone has, uh, could you make your way back there really quick? It's a little bit hard to see, but I believe we see someone right there. Okay, thank you very much. Your question. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for your outstanding presentation. Can you kind of explain the marriage of SNCC and, the, uh, and Kwame Ture's joining the organization, and then again, Kwame Ture leaving the organization. Leaving my organization? Yes, the Black Panther Party, because I think he held a position as- He said leaving. Leaving. Le leaving. Did he leave the Black Panther Party? Yeah, he resigned, I asked him to. Can, can you go in? <laughs> it, was a, it, 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 it was a quiet resign, but it, it, it was um, a difference of opinion we had about our coalitions with our white left radical friends. Uh, he, he didn't like it. And uh, I says, well, we don't see the value of it. We don't have a coalition with the Ku Klux Klan, no. <laughs> you know what I mean? But these are people, these are human beings over here who say that they want to boom. And they start getting shot, killed, and, 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 and right there at University of California, Berkeley, you know what I mean? And uh, protesting for constitutional democratic civil human rights. And I asked, and then I, when I came back from Sweden, I did a whole Scandinavian tour at that time, at one point there for 10, 11, 12 days. Wow, that's all messed up. Uh, I come back and then I'm charged with crossing state lines to start a riot at the 1968 Democratic Convention. And we post bail or something like that. And then, uh, it, in other words, they would indicted me while I was while I was abroad for 12 days, and I was supposed to go to Helsinki, Finland, and I did do that, but people kept mentioning in different meetings, people, individuals would walk up to me and say, uh, when are you gonna go to Helsinki? I said, in a few days. Well, when you get to Helsinki, Finland, you know, uh, you'll only be 125 miles from Leningrad. And I says, and what? <laughs> well, you could go there if you needed to, I said, well, I don't like, I don't, I don't like the Russians. What? <laughs> you know, I said, I'm not going there, you know, later for y'all, you know what I mean? As far as I, you know, I make jokes and stuff. As far as I'm concerned, Russia, United, USSR is an underground member of NATO, and they printed that stuff. <laughs> 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 but I, I, I didn't care for Russia, you know what I mean? It's over there somewhere. <laughs> but anyway, I come back, and then uh, I told the Central Committee that we want to, Get, try to get Stokely either to accept where we're coming from or resign. And I think he just decided to resign. Let's take, let's take another question to my left. Hi, thank you all. Um, so I feel in some of my peers, we've had conversations that um, what's going on, it's not more about a, uh, a movement, but a moment that they're creating. And so I wanted to get your perspective on uh, what you feel the organizations are doing today. Well, I think the Black Lives Movement is right on time. It's, 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 it's a young, youthful generation of young brothers and sisters 
and, and, and I, I think that's very, very important. I just wish that they would, see, people got to get, get me to these colleges. You know, the Koch brothers and other people uh, with the Tea Party people have, oh, no, they start blocking me from speaking to colleges. They, they, they finance organizations, and they hear I'm trying to come to a college, and they try to stop me from coming to college and university speaking. I have, in my lifetime, spoken more than 5,500 colleges and universities throughout the whole of the United States of America since 1967. And in the last four years, that just dropped, you know what I mean? And it's because these people, and even some of the lecture viewers dropped my name, you know, and that's because the Koch brothers' dark money behind the scene is buying people out to, to, to stop Bobby Seale and others like me from speaking and lecturing at colleges, you know, it's explaining this very history. Now, I want the Young Black Lives Movement people to deal with that committee leadership that I keep talking about in all these little cities and folks areas, the same kind of committee leadership I had of each one of my chapters and branches in all the cities and 49 areas, you see what I mean? And that committee leadership informs itself in every level, politically, et cetera. And not only do is there coalition relationships with positive or progressive politicians, et cetera, this is what we need more. We need more positive, progressive politicians. And we have 90 in the House of Representatives right now who will vote on progressive programs, such as, <laughs> from, from, I'm saying monies and funds, et cetera, jobs and programs, the infrastructure bill that, that, that the Republicans and others are, bl are blocking, et cetera, and so on. I'm a programs person. I don't like too much of extensive belaboring, intellectualizing and over-intellectualizing stuff, you know what I mean, and theorizing. I like to do things and build things and put up programs and organize people and teach them and inspire them, et cetera, to get organized. And that's what I did with my organization, the Black Panther Party. And um, I want to see Young Black Lives Movement develop some. Now, the next, the main, main program I'm working on now, which I've been working on off and on, is my environmental renovation and youth jobs projects. That's related to the ecology. I'm saying that the big time issue that programs and things are going to have to evolve. Money is going to have to be released. Yeah, I want uh, 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 um, Clinton to win this stuff and, 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 and push um, these Republicans and others to the side. Take head of the take control of the Senate, and if you can get a landslide election, and, and, and if they can take control of the House. And we'll get not only an infrastructure bill, we'll get an infrastructure ecology bill, not only for one and a half million jobs, but for three to five million jobs in this country. And they will be jobs here and not overseas. That's the kind of stuff that's got to happen. And we got to stand for that. And I think the Black Lives Matter movement should attach that and try to start any various programs. I don't give a darn if it's a leasing 10, 20 acres of land and creating a cooperative, people's community cooperative vegetable gardens and stuff where they, you know, cultivate, et cetera, all kinds of vegetables and sell them to the people in the community who become members of the little co-op and maybe you get your, your vegetables for half price, what have you, et cetera. Even those kind of programs, all kinds of programs get, can, can happen. Me, I'm a builder. I was raised a carpenter and a builder. I'm an architect by the time I'm 15 years of age. You know what I mean? I'm doing lot plot layouts and three-dimensional structures for adding rooms and dens to the houses that my father and his contractor friends, you know, did. I give them the plans, they put their names on it, et cetera, but they my plans. I did all the <laughs> spec. So, but that's because I was taught and raised a carpenter and a builder. My grandpa was a carpenter and builder. My grandpa, because of the Seal family that we work with, and that's where we got our last name from after slavery was over. The Seal family, uh, they were the bankers in Jasper, Texas. And uh, my grandpa, Art, my, uh, when, 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 they, when, you know, they come to the banks to get money to do building instruction. And in a little town called Weirgate, Texas, 500 homes had to be built. 
My grandpa was the contractor because old man sealed the white bankers, et cetera, said make seal do it because my father, my grandpa, and he's the one that was the, the contractor to build all those houses. So that's my background. So by the time I go to the United States Air Force, I'm high tech. Truck repair, high performance aircraft, B-52 bombers, whatever, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so I was lucky to have all these skills, trades, and professions by the time I got interested in the civil rights movement. So I want us to put up more jobs. So that's what I'm trying to do. Now, we got a bill coming up in our city, in, in our county, for $580 million worth of bill coming up in the county of it. With me and con Congressman Dillums, former Congressman Dillums, who's a good, very good pro personal close friend of mine, boom, 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 working with them, we trying to hustle and try to make sure that a third of that money goes to low income, eco, e e e eco friendly low income housing so that black folks and other poor folks and all the cities that would not be displaced and just thrown in the streets and forced out. And so these are the kinds of things. So I want a youth jobs program, youth jobs framing programs, you know, 16 to 29, I call it for youth, you know what I mean? And uh, we want jobs. These, these 16 to 29 people are going to 10 years after that is going to be 26 to 39. Homes, families, et cetera. Jobs. That's what's it, that, that's key to it, you know. Um, Bobby, Steve, go ahead. Do yes, go ahead. I mean, <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> Mr. Steele? I mean, one of the you know the, the, to answer your 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 question, one of the things Bobby's talking about is, is is I see the Black Lives Matter movement. It's pretty much a single issue, and it's an important issue. But if it's if they're going to grow, they need to really make coalitions with other groups. They need to get more involved in politics. I was, it, it made me happy when I saw on CNN that one of the leaders had endorsed uh, Hillary Clinton. I don't know if, if the whole organization has, but to actually get people elected, um, to start programs, um, to really move beyond just, a, just a, a, a single issue. And I think that's you know, what Bobby was speaking to, and I think that that's what was unique about the Panthers and I think that's really important. I mean, if you look at um, the Bernie Sanders campaign was incredible. Millions of people um, came out and, and voted, voted for change. We need to, to build upon that. And um, Black Lives Matter, if they want to really make change, needs to hook up with some of those people and really make a coalition so that they can um, get community policing in, in, in more areas so that they can change the justice system. We all know the drug laws, which were started by Richard Nixon, he did it specifically to target African Americans and, and white liberals. He said that. I mean, that's on the tapes. I'm not making that up. You can go look at the, the Nixon tapes. He was stated that in meetings. Um, if you look at schools, in, in predominantly African American communities, kids as young as kindergarten are interacting with the police when they're disruptive in class. Why do you need the, a policeman to go in to talk to a five-year-old? I mean, come on. If the teacher can't handle it, she, ought to, she or he ought to quit and they ought to get a new teacher. <laughs> you know, so, uh, you know, th those are the sorts of things that need to happen, but they're only um, going to happen. And I think Black Lives Matter is moving that way. You know, I, I don't have any personal contact with them, but I just read things. It, it looks like they may be moving that way, but if, if we're going to have real change, that, that's really what needs to happen. And certainly, certainly they are. I would encourage everyone to check out the Movement for Black Lives Matter platform uh, and position statement. So they certainly are moving into coalitional politics and certainly beyond sort of a single issue. We have, we have time for a lot of more questions, but we really only time for one more answer. Uh, <laughs> So let, let's go. Let's go to uh, the. Is it, is it the left or the right? So it's on this side. Okay, let's go. Let's go right here, sister. And, and, so and we'll have some time afterward to sign books and stuff. So let's go. One question, one answer. Okay, I think this will be easy. Um, my family moved to Oakland in 1968. My uncle met us at the airport. The first thing he did is take us to the jail. I think it was Huey Newton, was incarcerated, and I remember talking to him through the jail cell and asking him why he was there. And I was 10 years old. My 10-year-old granddaughter is with me today. Um, Mike, you, you talked a lot about voter registration. And 
I, I'm just wondering if you can fill in a gap in my family history. My uncle told me that he did a lot helping you and others learn how to register people to vote the right way. His name is, uh, his name was Rene Davidson, and they eventually named the courthouse after him in uh, Contra Costa County. And I'm just, I heard you mention the voter registration a couple times today. Could you talk to us about how important that was and how important that still is for people like my 10-year-old granddaughter who are getting ready to leave? We first started that voter registration heavy when Sister Shirley Chisholm said she was running for political office. President. I created quick coalitions with other groups particularly Congresswoman Barbara Lee today. Back then, she was at Maryland's College in Oakland, California. She had created a committee to elect, uh, a Mills College committee to elect Shirley Chisholm. So it was just a process of going down to the um, uh, voter registrar's office and requesting somebody to come out to St. Augustine's Church, the place we started our first breakfast program, and uh, make voter registrars. So I have 50 people at a time, 50 brothers and sisters at a time become voter registrars. Plus we coalesced up with Peace and Freedom Party. Peace and Freedom Party was a progressive organizational framework. And they would come to our rallies, our literal rallies, and we have, I put 5,000 people in the park. We did that over and over and over and over and over. It was nothing, that was the organizing of the norm of the, of the day. But we're having rallies, free Huey this, free Huey this, programs this, sign up for this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But you got voter registers everywhere. Now, in that first year's time of voter registration, we, the Black Panther Party, wind up to be partisans on the ballot for areas for, for political seats that you would be partisan for, like state assemblymen and stuff like this here. Uh, city government didn't allow partisans, you know. But I'm just saying, we were in, the, in Alameda County. You see what I'm getting at? So it's important because what you're doing is you're uniting people with that vote. You got to deal with that vote. To sit up and ignore the vote and, and, and et cetera, and, and your vote, you know, it's, it's, it's just one of the reasons I convinced some young brothers one time in 65, I says, down south in my demographic research across the south from the Carolinas back to Alabama, Georgia, and other states uh, coming on back to Mississippi, et cetera, I found 20 counties that had 50% or more black population all across. So I says, if you could get all these brothers and sisters registered to vote, you can elect a progressive, take no crap, black sheriff. And if the Ku Klux Klan get to messing up, you know what I mean? You can, that sheriff can deputize 100, 200, 300 brothers and sisters, all with arms, go over there and arrest them damn Ku Klux Klan for, for jumping on and killing and murdering people. I says, that's power, brother. Don't you understand what I mean by people's unity, et cetera, and getting you some, getting in the laws. You see, you, you be in the realm of the law. That's what's happening. So the importance today of this is that we need, well, let me say it this way. By the end of the 1970s, all organizations and groups who was about getting people registered were, remember I said it was only 50 people duly elected in the middle of the 1960s. 15 years later, by the end of the 1970s, there were 7,000 black men duly elected to political office, black people. By the end of the 80s, it was almost 15,000. It's over 20,000 now. Plus, Chicano, Mexican American, Latino brothers and sisters really began, you know, with the 80s and the 90s, getting registered to vote heavily. The reason these problems don't want, do not want to pass no path to citizenship for 12 million Latino people mm -hmm. is because they're going to wind up 99% over the Democratic Party and it's going to take rightfully so and push that, 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 that right wing corporate supporting uh, <laughs> Tea 
party Republicans and and and, and, and simplistic idiot punch. <laughs> I mean, that's what we gotta have. More progressive politicians. And you young brothers and sisters in Black Lives Movement, you gotta participate on this level. You know what I mean? Those who, who think they can deal with the politics, and you have to have committees and groups and organizations in the community with ground campaigns to get the vote out, et cetera, so you can keep control of the House of Representatives, et cetera. And you gotta do this also for your local community areas, county supervisors, city councils, state representatives, et cetera. This is, this is, this is all part and parcel of the movement. You ask about the importance of voting. The importance of voting is to get that so we can change those laws, allocate this money right, talk in enforce constitutional democratic civil human rights for everybody. Wonderful. Yeah. So ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, you just received in the last 45 minutes to 50 minutes a first person history of the Black Panther Party for self defense. I hope you caught it all. <laughs> but this is really the beginning don't let this be the end of your study. Uh, I hope you've picked up on some of the key elements, the origins and connections to the struggle in the South, Lowndes County, Alabama, Lowndes County Freedom Organization, yeah. where Stokely Carmichael was a project organizer. I hope you picked up on the importance of one of the first programs, the first program of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, the police patrol. But then also, I hope you keyed on how significant and widespread the survival programs beyond just policing the police, the free breakfast, the, the health clinic, some 60 plus survival programs. I hope you keyed on, we don't, don't think about the Black Panther Party as being connected to electoral politics, but Brother Seal just explained uh, the importance of that to forming the party early on, and then certainly their role in the early 70s, linking grassroots organizing to black political empowerment and black office holding. Uh, and I also hope you keyed on, picked up on the significance of the legacy of the Black Panther Party. We hear the echoes of Black Panther Party organizing the 10 point platform in the platform of the Black Lives Matter movement. We have to locate them on the continuum of the African American freedom struggle and see them very much, uh, the most positive aspects of them as being inheritors of the legacy of the Black Panther Party. So how do you do that? Uh, we have this wonderful book that they collaborated on uh, and we have it available here with these fantastic images where you can really get a rich and truthful and honest history of what the Black Panther Party was. Uh, and so we're gonna head out to the back. Uh, they'll have those books available. You can pick them up here. If you don't, if you can, if you don't get it here, uh, make sure you pick it up somewhere and continue to study and to learn. You have the last word. Well, you want to pick, if, if, if you can't pick it up here, you just have to do it later, go to my site. <laughs> Bobby Seal, one word, B-O-B-B-Y-S-E-A-L-E dot com. You can order that book. I ship it priority, autographed, what have you, et cetera. And I got all other kinds of books and stuff <laughs> related to our history and stuff. Just go to the site and then you guys get in your colleges and stuff like this here, and you bring me to those colleges because I want to give workshops, I want to give lectures, I want to speak, and I want to teach you the fine particulars and the methodology of effective grassroots people's community organizing. Ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Shames and Chairman Bobby Seale.